Hello everyone. Good morning to all our esteemed guests. Welcome to the Beef's Roundtable on the topic War, Famine and Turbulence, Global Trends 2023. The moderator for today is Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, President of Beeps. Our speakers for this roundtable are Dr. Famida Khatun, Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain, and Mr. Shafkat Munir. Without further delay, I would like to request the moderator to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. And a very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Thank you for coming to BIPS monthly roundtable in which we always discuss on a major and a critical strategic and a security issue. Today we are discussing on the Global Trends 2023. As we usher in the new year, we are trying to see and analyze what the future holds for us in Bangladesh and globally and internationally. As the world moves past the COVID-19, hopefully, there are several issues which are beginning to disturb the international system. The ongoing war in Ukraine continues. It is now 11 months past, but yet there is no end in sight. Rather, there are new complexities that are coming into the war and the conflict, and the potential for escalation remains very high. We are also intrigued by a recent statement by former Russian president and former Prime Minister of Russia, Medvedev, who says that Russia cannot rule out the possibility of utilizing nuclear weapons. So that adds a new dimension to the whole complexities. Our speakers here will also highlight on the grave financial and economic uncertainties that loom large today in the world. And the World Economic Forum has indicated that there is a real possibility of a recession internationally and globally. We are worried about the food insecurity that hangs over us. According to the World Food Program, 900 million people are already food insecure in the world. With supply chain management difficulties and other production difficulties, the numbers are going to go high. The even has already indicated that 28 countries, including Bangladesh, are extremely food vulnerable. So therefore, food security is going to be a major issue in the current year. The problems of energy security continues and it will aggravate in the current year. We are also keenly observing the various potential flashpoints for potential conflict that looms large, notably the Taiwan Straits and the Sino-Indian potential conflict in Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh. There is also serious concerns about a deteriorating climate and unless we are able to achieve cap the temperature as per the Paris Peace Agreement at 1.5 degrees then we are looking at some catastrophic changes in the weather and the climate pattern in the world. This is also a year for elections so almost the whole of South Asia is going to polls. Similarly, in other parts of the world, some major elections are going to be held this year with potential for destabilization as we have now just observed in Brazil and the potential also hangs in other places. The, there is also tendencies for democracies moving towards more authoritarian regimes. So several other issues re regarding elections also need to be looked at and discussed. And finally, we are looking very keenly at the development of disruptive technologies, the metaverse, the negative use of algorithms, autonomous weapons, large-scale use of AI, all these will dominate various issues and events this year. 
So we are in for a very lively discussion this morning, as you can see. And we shall first start with Dr. Fahmida Khatun, <coughs> who specially will tell us about the health of the economy in Bangladesh and globally. Dr. Khatun is the executive director for the leading economic think tank in Bangladesh, Center for Policy Dialogue, CPD. Fahmida, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Moderator, Major General A.N.M. Munuzaman, um, and good morning to everyone. I'm really privileged and honored to speak at this August gathering this morning. Um, I see I uh, have about uh, 10 minutes or so. So I'll just, uh, what has been um, given uh, by um, General Munuzaman as, a, as an overview, in front of you, I'll just elaborate some of these points in the context of Bangladesh. And then we have a Q&A session. I think that session will be more lively. So at this point, I'll just highlight a few issues um, of Bangladesh economy. So as has been rightly mentioned, that the global economy is going, to, um, going through several challenges. And unfortunately, the future doesn't look very bright. So um, 2023 is going to be another bad year for the global economy. Several economies will face recessions, and particularly three large economies, the USA, the EU, and China, will continue to slow down. And international monetary organizations, they have predicted um, on the eve of the new year. In fact, um, in the Davos meeting also, the discussion on recession has come again and again. Um, in fact, uh, earlier in October 2022, the IMF had downgraded global economic growth from 3.2% in 2022 uh, to 2.7% for 2023. Um, so, but if the pressure on the global economy continues, then this growth uh, might come down even further. And uh, as we know that from time to time, international organizations like IMF and World Bank they review and they come up with different numbers, uh, updated numbers. Um, and also, uh, with the green growth outlook, the world will continue to face uh, the challenges of high inflation in 2023. And as a result of this, we know that a large number of people who are low-income um, households and limited-income households and, and the poor, of course, they are, uh, they are to spend a lot on their um, livelihood, particularly on the food and fuel. And if we look uh, the context at the context of Bangladesh, it is not uh, also very good. Uh, if we look at the, some of the trends of Bangladesh economies, that will tell us that how the current situation is. Of course, we know that for a long time, Bangladesh economy enjoyed a macroeconomic stability um, in the past decade or so, but it is not the case anymore because as you know that the COVID-19 had affected the economy and as soon as the COVID uh, was, COVID affected economy was going to turn around, then we have seen the war which has affected uh, all economies across the world, supply disruptions, production reduction, and increased cost. So that has really affected people and also the industry, the private sector. Um, so I will focus on a few issues like inflation, then uh, the external sector of Bangladesh economy, the banking sector, and a uh, little bit of the other you know, fiscal um, issues also. So in case of Bangladesh, we are seeing that the inflation, the official inflation rate is something, but as when you go to the market, then you feel something different. The, of course, the uh, inflation rate has gone as gone up as high as over nine percent, but it has started to decline. In um, December 2022, the inflation reached at 8.71 percent. Um, of course, this is much much higher than the official projected inflation rate, which was uh, projected to be 5.6 percent at the national budget in June 2022. 
and uh, last, in fact, last December also saw a high inflation rate, which was 6.05. But now, if you within a span of one year, it has increased more than two point, almost by you know three percent or so. So, which is a uh, very, very, uh, very uh, disturbing in the sense that. This is an average inflation rate, but if you look at the commodity baskets, uh, we do we follow the prices on a daily basis, which is collected by Trading Corporation of Bangladesh. And there, if we see a basket of commodities which are consumed by the common people, many items have gone up by 20, 30, 40, even 50 percent. So that's uh, why that average rate may not be, you know, it is an average rate, but for the poor and low income families, it is much, much more. So this is, um, in fact, uh, since our economy is uh, integrated with the global economy, so some of these inflationary pressure is coming from abroad because we have to import um, many commodities, essential commodities, including oil, edible oil, uh, then um, sugar, and uh, wheat, and all these. But some are imported inflation, but not all, because what has happened because of the distorted market, then um, in the and the market is dominated or captured by a few players. That's why they are the price setters, um, uh, and uh, they manipulate the market um, as and when it is convenient for them. At this point in time, many of you in Bangladesh uh, know that the ginger is not available in the market. So, uh, in the excuse of many things. So, this is the, this is how the market prices are determined. So, in case, this is the inflationary situation. Um, and uh, I'll come uh, to the measures which have been taken by the government I'll, maybe later. Uh, but then coming to the other um, issue, which is also fueling the price hikes, that is the fuel prices. And uh, during the past two years, it has really added to the sufferings of the people. Fuel prices were raised by 51.2% for octane and 42.5% for diesel in August 2022. And this has really added to the pre-existing difficulties, as I have mentioned, um, due to food price hikes. So this price hike happened uh, during a difficult period and too soon. Um, many of you remember that you know, before that in um, November 2021 also there was another uh, spell of rise uh, of uh, diesel and kerosene by as high as 23%. And uh, later in November, on particularly on November 21, uh, 2022, the, um, the Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission increased electricity tariff at the bulk level by 19.2%. So it was at the, uh, not at the consumer level, but at the retail level. At that time, it was much discussed and it was apprehended that this price hike is going to percolate uh, through the consumers. And in fact, exactly that has happened. And um, recently, the government has announced that uh, the retail price of electricity that uh, will be again increased by 5%. Um, this has happened by uh, many of you which, who follow the price setting of the um, energy in Bangladesh, that there's Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission, which uh, discusses and uh, the possibility of increasing. There is a long discussion. So this has happened by passing. So um, this is another source of high inflation. So inflation, at this point in time, inflation is uh, one uh, enemy of the, you know, of everyone. In fact, uh, the pri price hike of fuel, it is affecting at the um, household level and also at the industry level. Uh, the private sector is going to be you know, affected uh, because the cost of production will be um, high, very high, and it will be very difficult to compete at the global level. Now, coming to the um, external sector, another sector which is also affected by the global um, economic challenges. Uh, this is also facing challenges during the last uh, one year, more than a year or so. Export has been very good, export growth, uh, but the um, growth of import and also less growth in 
uh, remittances have really made the external sector really pretty challenging because um, we are seeing that in the recent time also the one of the major export items of Bangladeshi economy is that ready-made garments. So that had really navigating through the uh, difficult period also. But as uh, we are discussing that import cost of many you know, raw materials of industries, uh, import cost of essentials, that had really gone up. And then there is a huge trade cap um, in the external sector. And sometimes uh, it is always the case that you know, the trade balance is, um, is um, sometimes, you know, it, it, it can, the trade gap can be minimized if we have a higher remittance. But we, in the case of remittances also, we are seeing that it is a decline. In fact, we had at one point in time, we had a negative growth. Now it is positive growth, but very, very low. It's 2.5% um, in, in, in the first uh, six months of the fiscal year, current fiscal year. So uh, where we are seeing that during the current fiscal year, which is 2022-2023, during the first six months, export growth has been good, 10.6%. Import is low, uh, 4%. So that should give some uh, you know, cushion. But then as uh, we are seeing that you know, in remittance growth has not picked up, and also there was already a huge trade gap. So as a result, we are facing, we are carrying on that gap and on top of that, the current account balance is also in the negative. Um, so the other uh, important and worrisome uh, feature of the external sector is that the depleting ex uh, foreign exchange reserve. Um, in June 2022, uh, in fact, you know, just uh, when the financial year 2022 ended, we had a foreign exchange reserve of about 41.8 billion dollar. But now, um, as of 19 uh, January, just uh, saw the data, 19 January, it has come down to 32.48 billion, um, according to the Bangladesh Bank. But this is low, lower than definitely 42 billion. But then more worrisome is that, um, many of you have followed that the International Monetary uh, fund has a different methodology to estimate foreign exchange reserves, and they are saying that seven point about seven point two billion dollar has to be, you know, deducted from them because that is not available to the government. It has been given to many um, organizations uh, as loan and invested in others. So it is actually not thirty two point four. Uh, it is less uh, by uh, about seven point two percent, which means that we have now about three months equivalent of import you know, cost. Um, this is okay, I mean, three, if you have a, reserve, have a foreign exchange uh, reserve which is able to import three months of import, uh, that's okay, we, but we had gone up to seven months at one point in time. But the worrying part is that it is depleting. So it, this three months, one doesn't know whether this three months will be sustained for for the next six months or so. So that is the one part. Um, and since we have, we are an importing country, so that is more worrying. And for fuel, we are totally dependent on imports. So that's why uh, the, the uh, maintaining the sustainability of the foreign exchange reserve is so important. Um, at this point in time, we were also you know, seeing that since cost of living has increased, but cost of production and cost of operation for any, for the private sector and even for the government also has increased. So there is an attempt by the government foreign travel will be curtailed or stopped. And the projects, we have a number of uh, infrastructure projects. So that those projects which are not really uh, very, which have not started, which are at the initial phases, those can be postponed at this point in time, and those which are about to be completed, 90%, 95% uh, are completed, so just focus on those. So prioritization of infrastructure projects have been uh, taken. So these are some of the other measures, but I, we have seen that not very successful. In case of foreign exchange reserve, also the Bangladesh, the central bank, Bangladesh Bank, they had, they had taken a number of measures. For example, that um, stopping uh, 
uh, the imports of luxurious items and then um, the monitoring the exchange, foreign exchanges, uh, foreign exchange uh, you know, dealings at the bank and many other uh, measures. Some of those are giving some results, but not much yet. So some, yes, because we are seeing that you know, the uh, import um, has gone down, but uh, it, it will take some time, hopefully. Then uh, the other sector of the economy, which is also lifeline of the economy, is the banking sector, which has been actually vulnerable before the COVID, before the war, before the COVID. So it has nothing to do with the uh, you know, global economic challenges. Uh, we had been facing uh, various types of uh, scams um, and uh, also uh, misappropriation of, uh, of the money which are kept in the, not only in the you know, state-owned bank, but also in the private bank. At one point in time, we used to you know, um, observe that the state-owned banks are not so efficient and all, they are always in the red. But now this has you know, spread over the private sector banks also. And the two indicators, one is the liquidity and the other is the non-performing loan. So the liquidity, if you look at the excess liquidity, it is declining uh, in the banks. And also the non-performing loan, uh, it is 9.3% of the total uh, dispersed loan. Um, in fact, during the last three, last uh, ten years or so, the um, the num amount of non-performing loan has tripled. Um, so it's in BDT, but uh, for those who don't understand, I have to actually convert it. But you know, in 2012, um, it was uh, in the fourth quarter of 20 fiscal year 2012. It was 427.25 billion. In the first quarter of fiscal year 2023, it has gone up to uh, 1,343.96 billion. As I said, this is almost, you know, in fact, more than three times. So, but this is also, um, again, International Monetary Fund um, and also economists say that this is not the real picture. So if you take other uh, you know, numbers, for example, loans in special mention accounts, loans in the, with court injunctions, and also rescheduled loans. If you take all these into account, then the number will be just simply at least doubled. In fact, the, why has this been you know, piling up this non-performing loan? Of course, the inefficiency of the bank, but this, the root cause is that the culture of letting off the willful defaulters um, that has really encouraged others also, uh, because if we, if you just you know give the benefits of not giving the loans, uh, then the other you know players in the market, in the private sector players, they are not playing at a level playing field. So there is an anomaly. Uh, it discourages the you know honest and those who want to have a fair play in the market. That's uh, very unfortunate. So in now, I'll just wrap up. Um, I have mentioned about the measures government in, in case of inflation to, to uh, tame the inflation. Some measures have been taken, but those are too little um, and inadequate. For example, um, in many, several months back, there was you know, a reduction of uh, VAT, value added tax on edible oil, that has been extended to palm oil also, uh, extended for some time. But again, these types of measures does not really become very effective since, as I've mentioned, that market is manipulated by a small um, players, small number of players. So mar strong market monitoring mechanism is very, very important and also you know, to show some uh, visible measures to punish those who manipulate those uh, the markets. The um, other measures of the you know, foreign exchange reserve and the external sector that is most important now. Um, there has been discussion regarding the you know um, float regarding having a floating uh, foreign exchange reserve. In fact, in paper, uh, Bangladesh had foreign uh, floating foreign exchange um, market but it never 
really functioned and uh, it was a managed float actually. So now recently um, after seeing that the, the stranger and uh, the volatility and the foreign exchange market, the central bank has opened uh, and the, led the market to determine the foreign exchange uh, exchange rate, rate, rate. But that that again came too late because in the last during the last year of uh, fiscal year, so we have seen that the exchange rate between Bangladeshi Taka and US dollar has been uh, strong, very hard compared to other competing economies. For example, China, India, Vietnam, they all had depreciated their currencies and this had really put Bangladeshi exporters at a disadvantageous position and we are keeping our uh, taka very strong artificially by injecting dollar in the market um, to, you know, against US dollar. So that really did not work well because as we know that we, are, we have a lot of exports, exporters were facing difficulties. Of course, uh, policymakers have a, t uh, have a tough choice to balance the exchange rate, but then um, you, one has to also know that when it has to be, um, it has to you know, inter intervene. So now uh, the f exchange market has been open, but it, we have yet to see uh, the stability. Uh, there is no stability as yet. There, is, there are still various types of rates. Uh, the exporters have one rate. Remitters have one rate, bank to bank one rate, uh, from central bank to the commercial banks they have one rate, the curve market has diff another rate, so different rates are really, you know, making that this foreign exchange market inefficient. So we need to streamline that one as well. Um, I think I should stop here at this point in time, but what I want to end with is that at this point in time, we are seeing some short-term difficulties. But these short-term difficulties are not, you know, uh, short-term, because of short-term issues. Some of these are medium-term, long-term issues. We have not looked into that. For example, the reform age issues, reform in the financial sector, reform in the you know, ex external sector, and also reform in the, in the, uh, in the institutions like, um, national board of revenue. I haven't mentioned about the fiscal space of Bangladesh that during this difficult time, uh, the government has to provide support to the poor families, to the small businesses. But where is this fiscal space? We only have a tax GDP ratio of about 8%. So with this limited fiscal uh, you know, maneuvering um, opportunity, we really can't do much. The government cannot really do much. So that's why it has to juggle between uh, various choices, where to put the priorities. Of course, the priorities will have to provide it, have to be provided to the poor families at this point in time. And there is a need for stimulus for uh, small businesses, micro businesses as well. But then at, that's why the institutional reform, which has been long overdue, um, had to be you know, completed as soon as possible as soon as possible um, and these while we address the immediate challenges the government also need to continue with the medium term policies and the world is facing the challenges each and every country big or you know large or small or medium but then there will be, of course, an end. I mean, all good things end uh, will come to an end. All bad things also come to an end at certain certain points in time. But then, those countries which have a stronger footing, institutionally, uh, management-wise, they will be doing better. At, they will be recovering better than those who are vulnerable. Those who did not look at the reform agenda. Those do not have a strong institutional mechanism. So that's why it's very, very important. With this, I would like to end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farminder, for giving us an elaborate account of how the Bangladesh economy and international economy is going to look like in the current year, 2023. Our next speaker on the panel is Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain. He's a former ambassador and currently a distinguished expert in the Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Aviation and Aerospace University. Mahmoud, you have the floor. 
Thank you, sir. B. General A. N. M. Munir Zaman, the respected chair of the roundtable, and my esteemed co-panelists, Dr. Fahmida Khatun and Mr. Shafkat Munir, and dear ladies and gentlemen present. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Dr. Fahmida Khatun has elaborately told us about the economic challenges in the year 2023. And she has very widely covered about the security challenges we'll be facing in the food sector as well as in the energy sector. So I'll be talking about uh, the political aspect of it, and that is not only provocative, very interesting also. The year 2023 begins with an ongoing war. This spells ominous impression for a new year. Intelligence reports say that Russia is planning a fresh offensive against Ukraine to recover its conquered territories, which she lost to Ukrainian forces. One cannot predict that the Russia-Ukraine war will come to an end in 2023. This portrays a gloomy picture of the world already hammered by the pandemic and post-pandemic turbulence. In the freezing winter, Russia could launch a big attack from Donbas in the east or even from Belarus, a puppet state in the north. Russia may even think of making a second attempt to take the capital, Kiev. Whatever it is, the consequences of such attempts will be gruesome and tragic for the world. If we go by the words of Kurt von Clausewitz, the great philosopher of war, that war is an organized violence, then the Ukrainians have shown that they are better than Russian forces in conducting violence in the battlefields. Putin has understood that Ukraine is not alone in its crusade against Russia. The United States and Europe have stood by its side by providing military, economic, and moral support. This is a big challenge to Russia's goal that the old Russian empire can be recreated once again. If that Russian dream fails, the year 2023 will be an ominous period in the history of the world. I have my own logic. Ukraine made a great sacrifice in 1994 when it surrendered the Soviet nuclear weapons on its soil. A sacrifice proved worthless 20 years later in 2014. On the other hand, Russia's nuclear threats are a proof that Ukraine has marked a superlative edge over Russia in hybrid warfare. If Ukraine is adequately supported, it can recover more territory. Ukraine has used HIMARS. A rocket system the Americans have been supplying since June to devastating effect against Russian ammunition stores and command and control system, allowing her forces a rapid advance in the northeast and the south. If Russia's trial reaches a point of no return, Russia might retaliate with the choice of tactical nuclear weapons. When it comes to the destructive image of tactical or strategic nuclear weapons, I can guarantee you there is no difference. Both are horrendous in terms of human casualties and in destroying the productive capacity of the soil, and which directly impacts upon our food security. That said, what will be the fate of geopolitics in 2023? The benefits of the war to the West is more or less clear. Russia has been enormously weakened as a great power making Europe's flanks much easier to defend now. For Ukraine, which has suffered horrific losses, the outcome looks much less certain in 2023. Due to Russia-Ukraine war, energy crisis will likely put the world into disarray. A simulation exercise played by The Economist magazine reveals that if Russia faces catastrophic losses on the battlefield, it will no longer care about money or even its allies in Europe, say Turkey and Hungary. It will opt for all-out energy war. It has already shut its main gas supply route to Europe, but Europe needs all it can get, so cutting the rest will wreak havoc. In that case, Europe's storage will be emptied by November 2023 and remain bare for the whole of 2024. The more Russian fuel cannot go to the market, the more Europe has to pay to other oil surplus countries to replace it. It will only hike the oil prices in the global market and become an excruciating economic pain of which Dr. Fahmida Khatun has already said for the developing world. In early October, if you remember, Bangladesh suffered from a grid failure that triggered a blackout across 75 to 80% of the country. 
till November 2022, looming power crisis where long power cuts and load sharing were common was a result of an exponential increase in oil and gas prices owing to Russia's energy war, OPEC's oil supply cuts and the European Union embargo on Russian crude oil. Being an oil importing country, Bangladesh was already feeling the pressure through high import payments. With high oil prices, the chain effect has fell through a hike in the prices of gas, fertilizer, and other essentials, including transportation and food. 2023 will continue to threaten Bangladesh's energy security. War is also traumatizing a fragile world towards famine. Food insecurity will be one of the great challenges for Bangladesh in 2023. Now, war coupled with food and energy insecurity, how the world order will be like in 2023. It is difficult to predict exactly, but some thoughts can be put in place to see things in their clear perspective. It is clear that 2023 will not be a West-dominated, US-led world order. Russia-Ukraine war has broken the confidence in the West-led norms and institutions. Russia's dalliance with China may turn out to be globalization going into reverse. China has a talent for part finding partners who are also in search of an alternative to the status quo. Therefore, in 2023, China-US rivalry will clearly dominate geopolitics because it incites China to accept universal values as a tool of American power. Even to Chinese who once saw the unipolar era dominated by America after the Cold War as benign hegemony are now disillusioned. In 2023, global leadership will matter to steer the world clear of its ensuing turbulence. Which great powers will produce such leaders to restore peace is the question. Europe is the continent which will be in the thick of war-induced turbulence. Can it invoke leaders of the like of Metternich, Castlereagh, and Talleyrand, who after the Napoleonic Wars shaped the politics of Europe for a stable political order? The answer is uncertain, but the Western leaders can no longer avoid President Xi and must not go down the path of confrontation with China as they have with Russia. That will be the test for the hypothesis of the wisdom of their leadership. In South Asia, 2003 will belong to India. There is no doubt about it. Mr. Modi is a rising star in the shadow of Russia-Ukraine war. The West will try to jostle to gain India's support, but Mr. Modi will skillfully play an ambivalent role to prove the idea that India, recognized as a nation, is the political philosophy of Bharatiya Janata Party. India will also likely play out the carrot and stick game with its neighbors, barring Pakistan, which is also reeling from multiple crises. For other South Asian neighbors, for India to play a zero-sum game, if she wants to, in economic relations, will be much easier deriving the encouragement from global economic recession, energy crisis, and food shortage. On the home front, 2023 will be a remarkable year for many reasons. Most important of them all will be how the political leaders avoid the path of conflict and make ways for reconciliation for the greater national good. We must also remember that democracy does not inhere in economic development only. Economic development is one of the elements of political goals. Had economic excellence been the only institution for enduring democracy, then many authoritarian regimes would be the best model for emulation. But it is not the case, at least in terms of human aspiration. Therefore, political goal for 2023 in Bangladesh should aim at institutional development. Given the conflictual nature of our domestic politics, the elections in January 2024 foretells a period of turbulence in 2023. It is up to our political leadership to demonstrate that they have the potential and wisdom to rise above the parochialism and steer us away from the turbulence beast striding the year of 2023, like that it happened in the year of 1938 and again in the year of 1940, in the respective Cold World War II and World War I, because of the failures of the leaders to bring about a peace amongst nations. Thank you very much. Mamun, thank you very much.
you give us a complete picture of what you see 2023 might look like in terms of conflict, war, and politics. Our next speaker is Shavkat Munir, Senior Research Fellow at BIPS. He's going to talk to us primarily on the several developments that have taken place and are going to look like in 2023 in geopolitics, in terms of technology, and in terms of conflict. Shavkat, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many friends together again. Uh, this is our first event for 2023, so wish you all a very happy new year. The previous two esteemed speakers have already covered a lot of ground, so my endeavor would be to basically sum up uh, some of the things that they have said, and there would be some areas where there would be overlap, but also to uh, touch upon the issue of technology. Because when we talk about security in the context of 2023, technology cannot be ignored or should not be ignored. First of all, as Air Vice Marshal Mahmood has very articulately pointed out, geopolitical competition will continue to loom large as we look at security in 2023. Whether it is in the case of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, its impact on the European continent and further afield in the Indo-Pacific, or the rising tensions between the United States and China that will continue to dominate the way we look at security, especially in our region. And I think it is very important for us to remember that uh, the geopolitical competition is uh, also increasingly having an impact on domestic issues as well. We have already heard an elaborate explanation on the impact of resource crunch and how that is going to affect our countries and societies. What I want to proffer in front of you is that resource crunch will also have an impact on domestic stability. We still have images of Sri Lanka in our mind from last May and June, and that has illustrated before us that when a country goes into economic crisis or severe resource crunch, it also has the opportunity or the potential of breaking down social stability. So that is something we will need to watch very carefully within our region and further afield. We are nearly 12 months away from the start of the war in Ukraine, and there is still no end in sight. And we have already heard about the risks that are ongoing. Uh, we fervently hope that some solution will be reached in 2023, but there is uh, not much hope that is currently in sight at the moment, or not much element that we can hope for at the moment. But the problem that I would like to particularly flag is the issue of potentially accidental escalation. Because so far we have seen a ground war being prosecuted uh, with aerial elements as well, but we are constantly hearing talk about uh, the potential of a tactical nuclear launch that has been ongoing for months. We hope that sanity will prevail and we will not come to that. But in the case of any conflict, the risk of accidental escalation by either party cannot be ruled out. I want to spend a bit of time talking about a, con a potential uh, crisis closer to home. That is the issue of Sino-Indian tensions. As we speak, the Indian Air Force has announced a large-scale aerial exercise in the line of actual control near Arunachal Pradesh as of yesterday. And uh, I have recently had the opportunity to visit India a couple of times. And uh, all the think tanks that I visited, everyone that I spoke to, uh, China or the potential con risk of confrontation with China is uppermost on everyone's mind. So when... Uh, confrontation, God forbid, if it ever were to break out China and India to nuclear powers, to great powers, the, some of the conflict zones that have been identified are very close to Bangladesh. So that is an issue that we as Bangladeshi analysts must pay very close attention to. So far we have seen some attempts at rapprochement and uh, as a result of that the tensions have been brought down a bit and we have not seen uh, too much in terms of escalation in the last half of 2022. But the fact remains that uh, the militaries of the two countries are eyeball to eyeball in Arunachal Pradesh, in Ladakh, 
and various other parts of the Sino-Indian frontier. So that is an issue that is a potential conflict that as Bangladeshis we must pay very close attention to. Most of the South Asian countries are going to election in the next uh, 12 months time. And uh, as this important democratic exercise takes place, given the volatility that is the hallmark of South Asian politics, we have to also watch carefully whether there could be potentially violence or turbulence, political turbulence in those, these countries as well. And again, I go back to my earlier point that domestic politics is increasingly interlinked with the geopolitical competition. So we cannot ignore that fact either. Let me now turn a, a bit of attention towards technology because I think technology's impact on our lives and society is only going to increase. The chair in his opening remarks talked about the rise of disruptive technology and that is something we have to <coughs> look at very closely. Uh, various types of disruptive technology have emerged over the last few years and in our earlier programs we have talked about some of the pitfalls of those technologies, whether it is 3D printing, artificial intelligence and so on. And what happens if some, when some of this technology falls into the hands of the bad guys? What happens when terrorist groups are able to exploit 3D printing in a large scale? What happens when uh, cyber radicalization uh, reaches a stage where it is difficult for state law enforcement and security agencies to control? Or what happens when artificial intelligence and autonomous systems are also used by nefarious actors? So these are certain things that we really have to grapple with. And particularly the worrying factor here is most South Asian countries do not yet neither have the mechanism nor the legislation to deal with disruptive technology. We're also entering the brave new world of metaverse with the idea of working and playing in virtual worlds, which so far was in the realm of video games and so on, is now going to become an increasing reality of our lives. 2023 will offer some illustration as Apple launches its first headset and Meta, the company that owns Facebook, decides whether to change its strategy as its share price as its language. So what happens when metaverse finally emerges, when we actually inhabit a real world and virtual world in tandem? How will metaverse, how, will, how are we going to provide uh, security to people in the metaverse? How do we uh, stop metaverse from being used by nefarious actors? These are some of the questions that we really have to grapple with. We are also seeing some major progress in green and sustainable technology. And one of the biggest challenges the world is putting, uh, facing right now is putting the brakes on our carbon emissions so that we can tackle the climate crisis effectively. In 2023, we see there will be continued progress around green hydrogen, a new clean burning source of energy that produces close to zero greenhouse gas emissions. Two major European energy companies, Shell and RWE, are creating the first major green pipeline from wind plants in the North Sea. So sustainable technology is going to become more prominent in 2023. But again, um, due to the conflict in Ukraine, some of the advancements that should have already happened after the Paris Climate Accords have already taken a back seat. We also have to see how energy security is going to shape up in 2023. We've already heard how the conflict is already hampering energy security of respective countries and whether that could potentially lead to confrontation between countries is something we need to watch out for. Any conversation in Bangladesh sitting in Dhaka about security is remiss if we are not talking about the whole issue of Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar uh, is going through its own share of political and security challenges and that has an important bearing on how we look at our own national security. While it is quite fashionable in Dhaka these days to constantly talk about a military solution to the Rohingya crisis, in our considered opinion as think tankers, the diplomatic solution is still the only ideal solution because war or conflict with an immediate neighbor can only spell doom. So uh, 
I just wanted to uh, put some ideas in front of you so that we can have a good discussion and just to give you a sort of uh, tour de horizon about some of the security challenges that are facing Bangladesh, the region, and the world writ large. Thank you for your deliberations. In particular, I quite enjoyed your understanding of the technology that is going to be a part of our life every day at individual level, at societal level, and at the level of the state. And I must say that we today truly live in a TikTok world. Everything that we do is now governed by social media and the likes. I also like to re-emphasize that our borders with Myanmar is a place to be watched very carefully. There should be no attempt at any stage to destabilize the border. A peaceful diplomatic solution to the crisis is the only way to go. So with that statement, I would like to open the floor for your questions and comments. Please feel free. This is a discussion that is going to be very lively. So I want you to participate. Thank you. Yes, Ambassador, please. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, uh, General Munir Zaman, <clears throat> and thanks to our three speakers who delivered in a short time a complete presentation of all the challenges ahead uh, in, in this uh, new in this new year. Uh, and they described it, uh, in my view, very accurately and uh, quite thoroughly. I, I would have many questions, but I will I'll just limit it to uh, maybe two, one question and, and one observation. Um, the, the first point would be um, on the uh, economic front. Um, <clears throat> what is, in your view, dear Famida, uh, the actual um, uh, impediments uh, which the government is facing uh, and uh, which leads it, leads it not to uh, uh, reform its fiscal policy and its monetary policy when it comes in particular to the many, uh, to the, uh, it's not even a duality, it's a plurality of uh, exchange rates, which in, terms, uh, in turn has uh, a big uh, impact on the foreign uh, uh, reserves uh, since a big part of the remittances is falling uh, outside of the uh, official um, foreign revenues uh, because of this lack of uh, uh, reformed fiscal and monetary policy. So this is a question for, for you. And I have uh, <coughs> an observation and a question to uh, uh, Air Vice Mar Marshal uh, Mahmoud Hussein, you <clears throat> at some point you you said that the benefit of the war uh, for for Europe or for the West uh, for Europe is, in Ukraine is very clear. Uh, Russia is now weakened. The way you you put this uh, statement, um, if if uh, anybody listens to this. You might think that the West orchestrated the war in order to have a weakened Russia, which of course is, is not the case. So I would just like to have a kind of clarification on what exactly you, you did mean, because I don't know if the West or Europe is benefiting in any uh, way of the war that Russia has uh, started against Ukraine. I think we are all suffering. Uh, economically, socially, politically. So I don't see any benefits of this war, uh, including for, for us. And a, a weakened Russia is not necessarily good news. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, uh, for that very important question. Actually, I was... Uh, I expected that there would be questions on particularly on the reform issues because there are so many areas 
Um, in fact, uh, uh, what is why the successive governments did not, you know, take any reform measures? It's a really uh, very difficult question, and it is a, it is a deep rooted, uh, you know, issue actually because it it is always convenient for it has been in the case of bangladesh but it has been convenient for not going for reforms um, the there has always been a lack of political commitment um, from the top uh, whichever uh, government or whichever party has been in the power uh, the you know, outcome has always been the same and over the years what has happened that policy making has been captured by the businesses you know who are who have a strong uh, interest in the whole um, you know management of the national wealth and all so if policies are made by majority of the you know people who are not you know, not uh, the spokesperson of those who are common people then you can you know uh, imagine that it is always convenient to have the policies in their favor and in institutional reforms means that there will be you know rule of law there will be disciplines there will be transparency and accountability and it has always been convenient that you know to bypass those and that is why the manifestation of which we are seeing that the you know this this um, um, conglomeration or the the, the uh, capture of the capital by a certain group. Now, if you look at the Bangladesh's you know, parliament, uh, the composition of you know, members of the parliament, over 60% members are business people. At one point in time in Bangladesh, you know, we used to observe that the, the there has been a ten that the uh, ministers or the you know, the political leaders they would turn into business uh, person. Now the business persons are turning to the you know, politicians because uh, they also have to protect their own you know, wealth which has been accumulated by the, the system. So it is a real, you know, it is a vicious cycle actually. So you, you can't really get out of that vicious cycle. And as I have said, without any strong political you know, commitment we will not, I, my apprehension is that we will not be able to come out of this vicious cycle. And regarding that, you know, uh, foreign exchange uh, duality or, or many other, you know, uh, rates which are prevailing in the foreign exchange market. So this has been, as I have mentioned during the deliberation that we have, we used to have a, you know, announced floating exchange rate but then it has always been commanded. So it is in the case of exchange rate, it is also in the case of interest rate, banks interest rate. So the, the perception of the, you know, those who are in the helm of the policy making process that we having, um, having a stronger um, you know, currency, local currency is good, but which is not, but then again, we also operate, I, I have some sympathy for the policymakers that they also operate in a very uh, very difficult circumstances in the sense that there is always pressure. So exporters will be asking for one rate that depreciation, but then it is also bad for the uh, importers. So uh, striking a strong balance is very, very important and which has not been done by the by the policymakers so far. So that is, that's why it is a strong, uh, so strong decision making process and also the linkages which you have rightly mentioned that you know the interlinkages between the fiscal and monetary policy we don't because of course when you take a measure uh, if the exchange rate is given to the you know open to the market and then obviously then your import cost will go high and then we import not only fuel oil but we also import essential commodities which means that it is going to be expensive for the common people also then how do we address that there comes the issue of fiscal policies that we give the government gives um, you know subsidized prices or stimulus uh, stimulus packages or they sell uh, essential items in the open market sale at reduced prices but where would the government get the money they have to have enough 
uh, fiscal space. So that's why it is, you know, to address the current situation, the, the, the right kind of marriage between fiscal and monetary policy has, is very, very important. And that's why that is not being observed at this point in time. Thank you, Your Excellency. I said that it weakens Russia. I use the term or the proposition from military point of view. Uh, militarily weak Russia is always at the interest of Western Europe because its flanks are now very weak. Russia becomes stronger, Russia becomes stronger, and Russia also becomes a threat to the Western Europe because this is what I'm historically telling because we have been fighting the wars, Russia has been fighting the wars with Europe uh, since long. Now, Hitler made the greatest blunder by attacking Russia in 1938 or 39. The other thing is that, Excellency, if you look at the map of Europe, uh, there is always, amongst the Russians, aristocrats, a tendency of revanchism, taking over the conquered land, okay, in the interest of their own geostrategic purpose or goal, because Russia always considered itself an empire, and Russia, Russia leaders always suffered from a kind of egotist, what you call it, hubbers. Uh, like you take the case of Tsar, later on you take the case of Stalin, and the Western Europe was never comfortable with Russian military advancement. I don't say that Russia should be made, uh, what you call it, economically weakened, but Russia, if it remains militarily weak, that is for the stability and peace of the global world order. And if had it not been so, then there would not have been any need for continuation of NATO even after the death of the Cold War. That was the point. That is how I explained it. Does it satisfy you? Thank you. Ambassador Shamim, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've been greatly benefited by the three presentations, uh, all of which have been very excellent. I will have two short questions, one for Dr. Fahmida and the other for Shafkat Munir. The one for Dr. Fahmida is regarding uh, the banking. The, what is your views? How do you see the, the health of the local banks here in our country? I mean, rumors around, fears abound, you see. So, uh, if you kindly address my question in the context of uh, the fear of the depositors. And the one for uh, Shafkat Munir is sort of, I'll make an observation, then you may pick up from here and also uh, answer my inherent question. The importance of digital data in our lives, I mean, the sort of access to data, the way we provide data to various agencies by way of bank accounts, by national ID card, passports, etc., and etc. And also the, the sort of uh, competition in, in getting international data, I mean, particularly in the context of industrial espionage, um, the sort of data piracy, all, I mean, all digital data. I mean, don't you think that this is also when you speak of the emerging world, a very serious matter, serious issue. And I was pretty much surprised that this wasn't addressed in your presentation. Otherwise, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a few more questions, and then we go back to your panelists. Admiral Lawal. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> My first question to Dr. Fahmida. Uh, as we have heard, the whole uh, global you know, economy is collapsing. The entire world is in stress. But there is one group which Oxfam has reported in Davos, the top 1%. They have accumulated $42 trillion in this pandemic uh, through this period in two years, uh, which is uh, double uh, the income of the entire uh, you know, humankind. Now, this is one, one scenario. And if you see in the context of vulnerability, the UN is trying to raise only $51.5 billion for 230 million vulnerable people worldwide, just $51.5 billion. And about the debt issue, 
100 countries have debt problem, which is around $2 trillion. Now, this one person has accumulated in two years is $42 trillion. Now, this is the scenario which, uh, you know, uh, UN Secretary General has mentioned that, you know, it's dismal and it needs the fixing. The recommendation uh, the Oxfam has given is tax the rich by, uh, you know, uh, only 5%. And that will raise $1.7 trillion, which is good enough to, you know, uplift 2 billion uh, people. But again, the question comes, if you want to tax the rich, you can't do that. They are so powerful. They control everything. And the most important thing is that uh, what is being revealed, that they don't have the thing in, uh, in a liquid form. They're all in shares and wealth and other things. If you tax on that, the whole thing will collapse. See, in Bangladesh, in our tax system, you don't find uh, our big fishes. They're not there in the list. It's all cows, Mia, and others, condiment uh, merchants. Uh, they're the, uh, you know, taxpayers. But our rich, the filled rich, if you take them, and if the bank withdraw their support, they're on the street. So in that scenario, how uh, uh, this uh, uh, the global uh, and whatever you do is the situation the global architecture the governance architecture is not the poor country or rich country when the uk is facing the uh, problem you know uh, the top one person is accumulating 70 percent of the rest so how to tax these people and how the global uh, financial architecture which is basically you know uh, you know doomed how that can be reformed so that the worldwide it can be benefited. And the second thing is about the geopolitics and globalization. Now, uh, there are talks about uh, globalization or deglobalization or reglobalization, whatever is the case. To my mind, uh, uh, you know, the geopolitics has become so toxic now that uh, you cannot have anything going. Uh, what is glo globalization? The trade and investment should flow where the profit comes. That was the philosophy. But now it cannot go because geopolitics has come in between. Whether Bangladesh will have the uh, investment or not, first thing they will consider whether geopolitically well Bangladesh stands, whether it will be coming under some sanction or some strain. So given that scenario, uh, how do you uh, see the for the panel the geopolitics versus uh, globalization issue? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Tohi, please. Uh, thank you. Um, as a non-economist, I have a one-liner on why the um, exchange rates were artificially kept low. Uh, to my mind, it was kept low so that the billions that were stolen could be sent out at lower cost. In Bangladesh, billions of dollars have been stolen. It's not normal income, but stolen money, most of it has gone abroad, and a lower rate of, you know, a controlled rate of uh, exchange helped them to send it out at a cheaper cost. Uh, but my, actually my comment is on uh, what Shafkat said. I fully agree that uh, an ideal solution to the Rohingya problem, which is on us and which is increasing day by day, uh, would be, of course, a diplomatic solution. But the question is whether we can have it. Um, the regime that controls Myanmar, they understand only the language of force. In five years, we have our progress in diplomatic solution to the problem has been completely zero, absolute zero. We have not gone anywhere. Um, and, and uh, I have a very favorite uh, saying of Frederick the Great that uh, uh, diplomacy without armaments is like music without instruments. Now, our diplomacy is not backed up by strength. So that is the biggest weakness of our diplomacy. That is the people who have strength, the other countries in the world, the important countries in the world, they have just abandoned this issue. They, have, they are not doing anything. 
I think one thing to observe in, in the coming years, or coming months or years, is the uh, Burma Act passed by the US Senate. Um, they have mentioned about the national unity government. I must say that the national unity government and the ragtag RB that has, uh, you know, un uh, not really coordinated military force that they have under them is going to defeat the uh, defeat the military regime in Myanmar. But uh, what the U.S. does about the NUG and what sort of help that uh, is promised in the uh, in the act comes up uh, is to be observed in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm coming to you. Please, microphone. Dr. Fahmida's expose has been excellent. You know, it has given a sort of explained very well the external factors which are affecting Bangladesh economy. But I would like to add how we can increase foreign direct investment and foreign assistance, you know, from you. And also the multiple exchange rate which is prevailing in the market, is it causing problem or it is supporting say in the, in making import cheaper? And there is a, a difference between a formal exchange rate and informal exchange rate, which you call Hundi. Uh, how can we sort of take measures to reduce it? Thank you. Thank you. Group Captain Zayed. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, a very enlightening session. I'll quickly go over a few, a few trivia and also a couple of questions. The first one is probably, uh, We've talked about the uh, election, uh, probably 2023 uh, is going to be uh, a year in a century where no G7 country will have an election. And out of the G20 countries, only two, Turkey and Nigeria, will have general election. Election means presidential or national elections. So they will have enough time to observe the elections all around us, uh, where, wherever it is happening. Uh, the other, uh, the, the question on uh, to Dr. Fahmid, and I was wondering uh, if we can touch on this one first is, uh, we are, of course, uh, there is a consensus that we're hitting a recession, but uh, the research have also shown that the recessions, uh, uh, particularly after 1980, tends to be shorter in duration. So do we have any research or any predictions about uh, if we at all have a recession, what would be uh, the duration of that? Uh, the second question also on economics is, do you see any chance of uh, mm, uh, prioritizing any other uh, currency as a global currency, replacing the uh, US dollar uh, in the coming years or couple of years? We have seen some hype on that uh, initially, replacing uh, the US dollar, but do you see any prediction on that? Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, Sino-Indian uh, conflict, to this comes to uh, a very, much, uh, very important issue. I would just try to touch on one aspect. If we have a Sino-Indian tension, should we be more concerned to remain neutral because uh, our foreign policy is of that nature? And I particularly bring up this point because uh, last last week, really, we had a news like uh, there is a cargo ship. Luxury ship traveling all the all the way from India to Liverpool. Now, could there be any lens uh, for the India for the Chinese to interpret it as a secondary auxiliary line of communication because Liverpool is very close to our country potential. So, should we, do we need to be more prudent into timing this kind of engagements when such tensions are mounting in, in particular fields? Uh, and final question. My very own mentor, sir, uh, and this probably is the million billion dollar one. What would be, in your opinion, what would be uh, a reasonable incentive for Russia to end the war? Thank you. Thank you. What uh, Mr. Shaftat has mentioned during his speech, and uh, Ambassador Tohid has already uh, pointed it out. The main factor of this region is now the Parma Act about Myanmar. If you go through the Burma Act thoroughly, you will find 
that through this act, the American Congress has the full authority to act to, uh, uh, say, allocate any uh, amount of budget or go for any sort of military or intelligence uh, operations in Myanmar. And that is the crux of the problem in this uh, area at present. And uh, we have discussed a lot about this Ukraine issue and others, but uh, at present, the uh, Asia is the hotbed of war, conflict, whatever you may say, or the hybrid warfare. And uh, if you see, look at the South, uh, South China Sea, there, in the, uh, there is the uh, say biggest military con uh, concentration uh, going on now from America, from Britain, from France, from Italy, from Australia, Japan, and South Korea. And only on the other side is uh, China. That's the biggest military concentration so far, if you consider that. And then comes this Myanmar and Bay of Bengal region. We cannot just uh, put it aside because we are beside uh, Myanmar. And if there is a war, if there is a hybrid war even, we'll be affected. And when there is a war, there is a possibility of famine. And if there is no political stability, no national unity, and if there is no social hegemony, and no, 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 not a good governance, then there is a big risk of this famine. And by that, also, we will not be able to say assess the situation correctly. If our government, if our political parties, our intelligence agencies are round the clock busy with politics, with the opposition, with many things, with media, this and that, then we lose concentration. This is the time for national unity, uh, social homogeneity. We all are from the same country. This is not the time for political division. As uh, Group Kapan Jahid was saying, or uh, somebody was saying from here, that this is the year of uh, election. OK, that is the ele election year, no problem. But that must be conducted in a free and fair process, fair way. Otherwise, there will be lot of political instability and we will not be able to absorb anything ushered upon us from outside. If we don't have political instability, there will be big possibility of war, famine, turbulence, anything. We must remember that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go back to our panel for the last responses and answers to the questions. We'll start with you, Formida. Thank you. I, I think a lot of questions um, have come. Some of those are interlinked. So I will just, you know, spend a few minutes, not much, not in detail, because I have uh, dealt some of those in during my deliberation. The first question asked by um, Ambassador here uh, regarding the fear uh, of uh, the bank depositors. So you see. Um, I can't, you know, I can't talk uh, on the basis of rumors, but I'll just go by the statistics, what is shown. The central bank um, has this uh, camel, you know, that capital adequacy ratio, asset management, and all these. So if you look at those indicators itself, these are official numbers. What are they saying? All these five indicators, which, is, which are there, I mean, those are weak, and those have been historically for a long time weak, and it is becoming weak uh, day by day. And among these two most important indicators, one is the liquidity crisis, which is related to your question, and the other one is loan default. So obviously, liquidity is declining. Excess liquidity, which you used to have, um, now it is declining. So there is a shortage, and of of course, because of various, uh, you know various um, scams and recently this anomalies and loans which have been given bypassing laws, uh, law, the existing laws and all. So that have created some panic. But then it is the responsibility of the policymakers and the central bank to assure the depositors. You see, we always used to say that, um, that you know, this is a sector which is uh, banks are too big to fail. Uh, historically, the central bank and the government had come forward to protect the interest of the depositors. And uh, that's why, I mean, at this point in time, we can say that we are facing some 
strengths, stress and um, in some of the banks, you know, there are more than 50 banks in the market, but then only five banks, so five to seven banks are in good health. So we still have some, yes, some hopes, but I can't say that, you know, we are about to fail tomorrow or not because it is a dynamic situation. Every day it has been, you know, giving some um, indications and then things are evolving. But then I wouldn't, you know, buy that it is going to fail uh, fairly soon. The issue of inequality, global governance and all these rightly pointed out and, uh, and also you have uh, in your question, you also mentioned about the, you know, some of the measures which are recommended, for example, taxation. You know, globally, this is an issue. It is also an issue in Bangladesh, this inequality is increasing. On the one hand, the global growth or global GDP size of global GDP size of Bangladesh's GDP is increasing. But on the other hand, we're also seeing that, you know, Gini ratio, Gini coefficient is increasing, inequality is increasing. One of the measures is through government intervention, that is through fiscal measures, that is taxation. And taxation in Bangladesh, it is abysmally low, but then those countries where it, there is good the systems in place, there are also loopholes in the system. And those billionaires which you are mentioning in Davos with Oxfam report, which has been unveiled, those, uh, you know, there also it is mentioned that because of this tax, you know, havens, taxation, weaknesses and loopholes in the tax system, the rich are getting away with it. Um, so there it is also issue of good governance. In Bangladesh, when we are talking about our foreign exchange reserve and somebody also mentioned that, you know, a lot of money is being swiped away from the system and then it is being parked outside the, you know, uh, country. And of course, we have a weak governance, but what about the global governance? So why those countries are inviting this money, which they very well know that these are the money which have been taken out, which are corrupt money, ill-gotten money, but they are just inviting that. Um, we don't have statistics, how much it is, but then some indications, the Global Financial Integrity Report, which is, uh, you know, a an institution based in Washington, they have some data they have dig down, but not full picture there. So during 2009 to 2018, they are saying that just by mistrading, um, you know, misinvoicing through trade, uh, there have been 8.27 billion taken out of Bangladesh. But then if we take the illicit financial flow through other measures that, you know, the so-called black money and all the money which has been taken by the willful defaulters. If we add to that, that will be also, um, you know, many more billions. So these money are smuggled out, out, out of the country, which is also another reason for, for the small or narrow fiscal space. Um, I would just also say one thing about the, the global institutions. Global, at this point in time, all the important global institutions are showing their you know, limits and their you know, inefficiencies in terms of addressing the challenges, global challenges. But then there is a need for it because we have seen that during COVID, how global decisions, global institutions can come forward. You know that because the, the, in case of the vaccines, um, you need, you know, for uh, for export for some drugs, you need licensing and patenting all these, and there's this TRIPS agreement within the World Trade Organization. We know that World Trade Organizations, the, you know, it's not going anywhere. But then during COVID, we have seen that how that flexibility given by the global leaders had really helped countries for exporting or sending out vaccines to poor countries, particularly. So. If these types of critical moments are very, you know, are the uh, testimony of the importance of global institutions. There are there is many other questions. I'm, I may be missing some. There is one question of the recession, the duration of the recession. You see, this recession is different from any other recession. recession. It is like the 1970s recession. Um, when we have observed the stagflation, as you know that stagflation is a situation when there is high inflation and there is 
unemployment. And we are seeing that large economies, which I have mentioned, that USA, EU, and China, they are facing a uh, you know, downward trend. And the USA, you have, you must be observing that companies after companies, big companies, you know, um, tech companies, financial companies, they are, they have announced laying off their work. So unemployment is going really high. So. And the, in Davos also global leaders have mentioned that this recession, the recession will be longer than 2008 recession. That was a much smaller and that you know, originated from a specific um, problem. But this has a larger scale. So one doesn't really know. That's why if you look at the IMF project, project, uh, projection uh, and projections of growth and inflation, they have a projection for the next you know, three, four years, which doesn't look very, very bright. Um, the, yes, uh, what else? I think more or less uh, I have covered. If anything is left, we can discuss afterwards. Both, please. Thank you, sir. There were a number of questions, but one thing we must accept from realist point of view, or from the way the world operates. We cannot simply wish away war or conflict. We have been reading about wars and conflict since the time of Thucydides. Uh, even Immanuel Kant, a great German philosopher, he talked about perpetual peace. But if you go through the articles, you'll find that he also talked about world forces. Uh, just to take action against those evildoers who bring about instability and chaos in the world order. We have read about President Woodrow Wilson's 14 point principles. What did he talk about? Did he talk about peace? Yes, of course he talked about peace. In those principles, these are embedded. But he also talked about collective security. Later, we find that it has been translated into the statement, an attack on wall one will constitute an attack on all. This is the premise on which NATO is formed. Now, the point, once war starts, then we start wishing for peace. And then comes in the role of the leaders. There's a very good question which has been put by Group Captain Zahid, asking me what would be the reasonable incentive to Russia to stop the war. It is very difficult to say, but there are a few things which we must accept. If Russia, one number one, if Russia accepts that whatever areas or spaces Russia has conquered, okay, let them be with Russia. Liberated, okay, say liberated, let them be with Russia. Russia will not go into any more, any more expansion or conquest of the territory. Second, no expansion of NATO no expansion of NATO. But the point is that whether the United States of America will accept it or not, the West will accept it now. Now there comes in the role of China, an intermediary. Because in the world, whatever we talk about liberal order, there will always be real politic organizing the system of geopolitics. Here, China will be benefited more than anybody else by by being an intermediary to bring about peace. Because China knows that it is a rising power in Asia. And in future, if it wants to dominate the states in Asia, then probably its role as a great power has to be in the manner that uh, the Great Powers Act, like we have seen after the first war, Second World War, after the end of the Second World War, when the world was to be created uh, in, the, in the regime of bipolar system, we found that two economies played a dominating role because they wanted that the post-Cold War era will have to be set up on economic preferences. One of them was Ted Baxter, and the other one was John Maynard Keynes. So my point is that will Mr. Xi be able to take that kind of role in mediating peace between Russia and the rest of Europe. Uh, only the Russians can tell and Europe can tell because Russia has made a mistake by attacking uh, Ukraine. This is my opinion. Great powers will act in their own 
in the own manner, whatever we say, they will always look at the global interest as part of their national interest. That is how they define power and the elements of power. The problem with Russia and the United States is, the United States will always invoke liberal principles. Now, though invoking liberal principles, he will just translate them into real politics. With Russia, the problem is this. Russia, in fact, starts with real politics. Now, Russia will not find out the ways for managing the liberal principles to accommodate its realistic perspective of geopolitics. This is the problem. This is a problem. That is why we are more and more driven to uh, the, the American philosophy of uh, governing the international system. Now, Imagine, they are asking us, in, like Famida has uh, talked about the global institutions, but most importantly, at home, we need to strengthen our national institutions. They are saying, how do they play the game? The Americans are saying that uh, what you need to do is to ha hold a free and fair elections. And what you need to do is to take care of human rights. Now, our point is that do we want this? If we want this, then we have got no, in fact, what you call it, uh, acrimony with anybody coming from America and sitting with us for discussion. This is the point. The whole world, in fact, is managed by ideas. Ideas are not only dangerous, they are also favoring someone or not favoring somebody else. This is exactly what is happening happening in this present crisis. But the point is that the war must come to an end. If the war has to come to an end, then possibly the role of China and India also to some extent can, uh, instead of becoming uh, too much anti-West, should play a pro-West role. But I'm talking about a solution to the ending the war and nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm conscious of the shortage of time, so I'll be very brief and we can discuss afterwards as well. Um, two questions were put to me specifically, or one question and a couple of question and observation. To Ambassador Shamim's point, thank you for pointing out the point about data privacy. I had it in my notes, but uh, since we were running short of time, I uh, could not go through it. Data privacy, digital privacy will be a very dominant issue because we are increasingly entering a world where data is power. So how we manage our data, how we manage our digital privacy, where do we draw a line between the state's right to know versus our right to privacy are questions which are going to dominate this increasingly uh, tech-inspired world that we live in. And in the case of Bangladesh, data privacy, digital privacy is going to be of paramount importance. And we need to have more dialogue in society about these issues. On the question of uh, former Foreign Secretary Tohid Hussain's point about our frustrations with Myanmar, as someone who has been involved for over five years in a track to initiative with Myanmar, I completely uh, share your angst and frustration. Um, when we started the process of talking to Myanmar in 2017, we had a lot of hope, but because of various factors, including the political volatility in Myanmar, we have not actually made a lot of progress. But at the same time, while I completely concur with you that diplomacy, unless backed by deterrence and force, is toothless, but uh, we also see a lot of irresponsible talk in Dhaka about seeking a military solution without taking the geopolitical context in mind, keeping the geopolitical context in mind. So uh, while I completely agree with you that yes, we have to strengthen our deterrence, we have to uh, seek a solution to this problem, but only looking at the military option, dispensing with diplomacy, and uh, without taking the geopolitical, con keeping the geopolitical context in mind is not going to work. Uh, there is a lot of uh, talk about uh, whether we can take advantage of the Burma Act and so on, and I think there needs to be a greater discussion and debate on that issue. We have to remember that Myanmar is an immediate neighbor, and it is not going to go away. We are not going to go away. So while we seek a solution to the Rohingya crisis, Myanmar 
could potentially offer a lot of economic opportunities for us as a land bridge to Southeast Asia in future once we have resolved our disputes. So completely jeopardizing our relationship with that country is also not in our interest. Uh, coming back to uh, Group Captain Zahid's question about uh, the Sino-Indian dispute and how we can play our own role, uh, I'm a little disappointed that there is not enough discussion and deliberation on this issue in Bangladesh. It is playing out right at our doorstep. Uh, many of us may not even be aware that when the Doklam crisis happened, Doklam is literally 100 miles as the crow flies from Bangladesh. And whether we talk about Tawang or uh, parts of Tezpur or other parts of the northeastern uh, region of India which borders China, uh, these areas are very close to our border. And we need to have more considered discussions, not just in roundtables and seminars, but also in uh, policy circles as well, about how will a potential Sino-Indian confrontation affect Bangladesh? And that is not happening at the moment, or at least not that I'm aware of. I would end by saying that one of the fundamental lackings in Bangladesh, which we really have to address, is a consensus and an understanding of what are, are our national security priorities. National security as a subject needs to be discussed and deliberated on more. There needs to be greater dialogue on national security, identifying our core values when it comes to national security, and having a coherent idea in mind, irrespective of whatever political differences or other differences we may have within society. On the question of national security, we need to speak in unison. Thank you. Thank you, Shafkat. We are coming to an end, but I will not try and summarize such a rich discussion. Just a few key takeaways that I found was interesting for me. One thing we must remember that there is a potential for accidental escalation out of Ukraine war. Any war or conflict is an unpredictable business, so accidental escalation is a real possibility at any war at any time. While you talk about the Ukraine war, we are somewhat forgetting other smaller wars and conflicts that are being waged for many years with tremendous consequences like the war in Yemen, for example, or the ongoing conflict in Ethiopia has not been sufficiently highlighted. I completely agree with my friend, the Secretary Tohid, about diplomatic solutions, but I am firmly in the belief that a conflict is not a solution. What we should try is for a credible deterrence so that we have power for deterrence over other elements and actors in the region. But any talk about escalation to point of conflict is not in our national interest. And that's the way I look at it. We must remember that although we are coming out of the woods in terms of COVID-19, but the possibility of a new pandemic is very, very real. We have seen the recent issues in China and the possibility of pandemic two is a real possibility and we must be prepared for that. The current inflationary rates in Bangladesh and around the world and a possible recession could be the points of destabilization and instability in many parts of the world, including our own country. We must also think that energy security is going to be a major issue for the current year. It's good that we are having a debate. The essence of all good discussion is a good, healthy debate. So I thank you all for being with us this morning. We've had a rich discussion and a healthy debate, and we are enriched by the presentations and interventions that you made on the floor. So please join me in thanking the members of our panel for their wonderful presentations. And also, may I request you to join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you.